want to talk a little bit uh, about what we might learn from the lean pioneers. And by that, I mean those in the past who are uh, the workers who have brought us uh, ideas to the present. Uh, we can learn some good things, and we can learn some bad things, and so we'll talk uh, about both of those. Uh, let me say about the lean movement, uh, first off, that uh, the great strength, great strength has always been the relentless focus on the frontline primary work to be done. As they often say at Toyota, what is the work to be done? And by that, what are the specific value-creating actions that humans need to take to create value for some customer? What are those? And so we focused on those and how to organize those. And the mantra that Dan and I developed many years ago, first start with value from the standpoint of the customer. What does the customer want? And then that value is the result of some value stream, which is a sequence of actions. And we would like that to flow continuously to the customer. When it can't, let's pull, not push. And then, of course, we want to continually improve uh, each of those steps uh, on the path to perfection. But that is a remarkable focus at the very specific level of value creation. And what we have not done so well is to talk about a companion flow of work, which is the work of management. That's incidental work. No one has ever bought a product, no one in this room has ever gone to obtain a product and said, is there a lot of management in this product? And if there is a lot of management in this product, I would like to pay more. Uh, no customer cares. You as a customer, when you put on your consumption hat, we all have two hats, take your provider hat off, put your consumer hat on, and ask how much as a consumer you care about management. Uh, and the answer is zero. You do not care. And our movement, if I may say, has at times proceeded as if it did not care about management either. That indeed management was sort of bad. Managers were sort of worthless. Um, and so therefore, uh, we have not perhaps been as creative as we should. So let's think about that just for a minute. Uh, the problem of management uh, has a long problem as long as lean. Uh, we don't really know where people had the first lean ideas. Dan and I trace it back to the Venetian arsenal, but maybe they stole the ideas from the Chinese who got them from you know, the Romans or whatever. Uh, it's a long time ago in history that people started thinking about how to focus on the specific acts of work and how to put them together in a sequence so that they flowed very rapidly to some customer. And of course, there's Henry Ford and a gazillion experiments with the micro organization of the work uh, since that time. So we've been so good at thinking about the primary work, but the question, the problem, as I say, is management. We don't know about the Venetians, that's too long ago, but we know about Ford, that uh, Henry Ford uh, was a unique character, and he did a unique thing. He invented a company, the world's largest company, that had a single product with no options that he produced for 19 years using a process for fabrication and assembly that was completely consistent across the world. And he designed the product personally, and he designed the process. And so when you design the product and the process yourself, and you're not going to have another product for a very long time, it turns out you can think very little about management. Uh, Ford himself was fond of saying that there was no org chart at the Ford Motor Company. Now, of course, this could not be true. But in his mind, uh, I think it sort of was true. Uh, the management system I describe as Ask Henry. If you have an issue, talk to Henry. Uh, Henry will have the answer. So that's where we started in modern times with lean management, was with Ask Henry. And then that, of course, didn't work uh, as you had lots of products and a rapid product cycle and you tried to operate all over the world. Uh, you really couldn't uh, do that. So someone did come along with a management system to deal with the need for both control and for flexibility out at the front line. And that was, of course, Alfred Sloan at General Motors. And he came up with a complete management system. Uh, by the way, if you have not read My Years with General Motors, you should, for your next long airplane trip, get a copy of My Years with General Motors. 
it is a must read. It is in the, from, from the front cover to the back cover, it is a complete total management system. Everything you need to know to manage in what we came to call modern management. He was the inventor. And that was elaborated by GE and others. And then it became business school management. And to this day, and by the way, a great frustration to us, what you still learn in business schools is modern management, not lean management. But shame on us. We have not been very effective at trying to change the way people do management education. And by the way, the notion, the very notion of learning how to manage in a school uh, is a modern management idea. You go to school to learn how to manage. Perhaps you go to a conference to learn how to manage. Of course, you learn how to manage by doing a lot of personal and collective management experiments. You learn by doing. There's only one way to learn how to manage, that's to actually manage. So we find ourselves uh, surrounded by a management process that is actually uh, completely backwards from a lean perspective. A managed by result system uh, in which one is obsessed with results as opposed to the process, that sequence of value creating steps that get the results. Uh, where we want to be in a world is where all managers know that if the process is right, the results will be right. And if the process is not right and the results are right, as they often are in organizations I go to visit, someone is not telling the truth. The scoreboard has been manipulated. So we have needed to move on beyond modern management. And it's fortunate for us that some folks in the lean movement for a very long time have been thinking about that, but we have not paid sufficient attention. So let's try to pay attention. And I want to do that today by, again, trying to help us learn what we should have learned from the founders. And by the way, some good things and some bad things, some things that did work, some things that didn't work, and also, as we'll see, the need for continuing uh, thinking about management because the work about what a management system is is never completed because circumstances change, values defined in different ways, and we need to move on. So I'll do that in three parts. First, uh, just talk a little bit about uh, Toyota, and then talk about what we did. And some of this, uh, Dan, was on our watch. In fact, we indeed were the sort of drum majors of uh, what appear now to be some rather odd ideas. Uh, but what can we learn from that? And then up to the present moment, that's bullet three, which is what is the challenge for us now, right now, uh, on our watch? Uh, what I'm going to ask you is your management system. Do you even know? And then how can you make it lean and have you tried? So what is your management system? Do you even know how can you make it lean? Perhaps you should do that on Monday uh, when you get home. Just an idea. Now, uh, we have, uh, as mentioned accidentally, Taka Fujimoto, our longtime friend uh, at the University of Tokyo in the business school, uh, wrote a wonderful book that you should read, another book you should read, called The Evolution of a Production System at Toyota. And he goes back in history and tries to sort out all of the experiments, and this was based on experiments that were conducted to produce a production system that we know as the Toyota production system and what uh, Ono did and what all the others did. And it's not just an exercise in trying to give credit to the right person and so forth. It is following because it was an evolutionary process through many experiments that gradually caused the system to take form and then to become very specific. So I've borrowed his phrase, uh, but I've substituted the word management for production because there was a similar evolution of a management system at Toyota that we need to understand. And I think uh, Takashi Tanaka is going to talk a little bit about the Toyota management system. Uh, you have that. Uh, yesterday I went to his workshop and sat in the back. Uh, you use that phrase very prominently, the Toyota management system, which one hardly ever hears. We hear about the Toyota production system, but uh, the overarching framework for that is a management system. So where did this management system come from? Well, uh, look, I'm not a historian, and I'm uh, not the expert on this, but just in broad brush. Uh, when the company started to grow in the 1960s and decided to take on the world, 
they realized that they needed a management system that would be as good as their production system, as good as their product development system. And they set out very consciously to create that. And that's what I always find interesting about Toyota, the degree of consciousness about what needs to be done. In this case, what needed to be done to rethink the work of management. They had made great progress in the work of the primary frontline worker, but what about a management system to go with it? And they did something in the early 60s that uh, they have done all the time. By the way, this is all in the 10-year histories of the Toyota company, which you can buy, which is all written down, a remarkable documentary record of what that company did, that what they did was to audit their management system. They actually did an audit. They had a department that thought about management, and they went out and audited, and by that they meant they observed what managers actually did and how the management system actually worked to arrive at a current state. For those of you who are familiar with mapping, we always talk about current state, future state. Those of you who are familiar with A3, you try to kind of characterize the current state by where you grasp the situation at the beginning. So they wanted to determine the current state of their management system. Uh, this is such an obvious, simple thing to do, and yet I hardly ever encounter an organization that has done this. They can tell you, could you please just describe your management system to me? And then they flop and they flounder, because actually it's just not the way people think. So they systematically set out, 1963, uh, A.G. Toyota, who will figure largely in this tale, was just uh, coming up to the bridge at Toyota. And he was the fellow who I think was the most important management thinker. Uh, by the way, A.G. Toyota, uh, a person you have hardly heard of, perhaps none of you have ever heard of, uh, was the president of Toyota for the longest serving president in the 60s and 70s. Uh, he was, a, of course, Toyota with a D family member. And I think he was the most interesting innovator of management uh, since Sloan. And yet uh, he uh, lives uh, largely an anonymous life. By the way, he's 98. He's still alive. Uh, lives in Toyota City. Uh, he was always a quiet man. He's still a quiet man. Doesn't, hasn't said anything in public, I think, in about 30 years. Um, isn't that interesting that uh, the great innovator in what I would call lean management is a totally anti-heroic figure, you know, the opposite of Jack Welch, or of Steve Jobs, uh, a guy who was quietly, quietly, quietly determining the current state of the management system at the beginning of the 60s, and then trying to figure out how, through a process of experimentation, to move to a management system that would support this powerful focus on the actual work to be done and how to marry that to customer need by looking at value. And the focus here, the last point, when talking about a management system is what is the work of management? And by the way, what are managers actually doing? And those are always, in my view, two different things. The actual value-creating work of management is not what most managers do. Most managers work very hard. Most managers are in that context and framework very good. But what is the work they are actually supposed to be doing? Now, in looking at the management system, they had to clarify uh, something, which was the relationship between the vertical and the horizontal. And again, this is something, as I go through organizations, there seems to be a, a widespread obliviousness. Uh, in any organization that has ever existed, uh, value flows, if it flows at all, horizontally. From start to finish, from concept to the offering of a product, from someone taking an order to you actually deliver it, from the time you deliver it to supporting that product through its use cycle. That is a horizontal flow across the organization. And all organizations, this is a rule that might have one or two exceptions, but all organizations are organized vertically by department and function and area. And then, by the way, on a complex value stream, there are many companies that have to collaborate along the stream, and they're all organized vertically as well. And by the way, they're in countries, and sometimes flow across countries, and countries are organized vertically. And then, of course, going all the way back to the individual, we are all organized vertically. Uh, my objective, I will just share with you, 
is I am trying to optimize myself. Okay, that is my objective function. It has one variable, that's me, and I'm trying to optimize my position, and that is the problem of civilization, that we are each of us, all of us, trying to optimize our situation in a world in which all value is created collectively as a group activity. So here we are, personal optimizers, trying to then optimize my area, my department, my function, my company, my country. So we spend a tremendous amount of effort on optimization. But who thinks about the whole flow of value horizontally to the customer? And every organization only survives by doing something for customers that yields enough income to keep going. And that's whether you're a for-profit or a non-profit, whether you're a hospital or you're a manufacturing company. So there's the problem. So in looking at their system, uh, Toyota needed to figure out how you could deal with a horizontal organization where value flows vertically. And they concluded that they could not get rid of the verticals. Uh, now that is a mistake that many of the lean pioneers actually uh, stumbled into of thinking they actually could get rid of the verticals. We'll get to that in a few minutes. The question was how do you do horizontal thinking in a vertical world? Second thing they wanted to think about was quality and how to get quality at the source. And uh, I think the uh, brilliant insight they had was that uh, achieving stable process that will produce quality at the source was the job of every single manager. Every single manager needed to have PDCA thinking, that scientific method, plan, do, check, act. Every single manager needed to approach every problem they encountered in the framework of PDCA. That our way of thinking, that modern management way of thinking, is let's create a department. Let's create a vertical where we have a group of very smart people, uh, who knows what kind of belts they might have, uh, who will be able to come flying in and deal with your quality uh, problem or your stability problem so that, in fact, you can outsource as a manager. Uh, you know, it's a world been full of outsourcing. Well, most modern managers outsource problem solving to some department, some function, somewhere. And then their job, well, what did they do? And when you observe what they really did, they dealt with anomalies. They were the firefighters. So that most managers ended up doing workarounds for anomalies rather than doing root cause fixes. And that was a fundamental um, change in the way Toyota thought. They were determined that every manager would be a root cause problem solver using a standard method called PDCA. And so they found some tools for that. And Toyota didn't invent policy deployment. They stole it from another company. But they actually made it work. And uh, all of you probably have had some bit of exposure to policy deployment, uh, trying to figure out how to make it work in a modern management system. And it turns out it's very hard. Uh, they also, and this is the early 60s, uh, that they found the tool they were looking for about how you get from the top to the bottom, policy deployment of the organization, how you think horizontally when you're in a vertical organization. And then they had their problem solving and deployment tool, which was A3. And by the way, uh, what's in the middle of A3 is PDCA. And A3 is the context, the managerial context for PDCA, where you start with grasping the situation, say what is the problem, what's the root cause, what are the alternatives that we might try on an experimental basis to deal with this problem, and which alternative do we try, who will do what when to implement that alternative to run the experiment to report to the group on what happened. And then the role there of uh, aging uh, Toyota was to sort of orchestrate the conversation, to bring to the surface that management was the big problem, and to encourage experiments on how to manage in a different and better way. Uh, Toyota started all of this with a determination to win the dimming prize. Now, I'm very skeptical about prizes, that uh, there are a lot of them around. I'm often asked to endorse prize winners. I often go to companies, terrible companies, that have won lean prizes. And so it's all very awkward. Uh, because what I see is that there was a program, uh, a moment in which they actually did something right. And that moment is already disappearing in the rearview mirror 
because there's a complete disconnect between the good thing they did and the management system in which it lives. And so, therefore, I can predict with confidence that the next time I come back, there will be no evidence of the good thing that was done because it's not part of management. It was done by some promotion office. It was done by some consultant who might be very good, by the way, from a technical standpoint, might just be superlative, but it cannot endure because there is no fit with the management system. And so the interesting thing was that they took um, the dimming prize and turned it into an opportunity to think even further about the management system and how to build a management context that would make it possible for the good things they did to win this prize. That was 1965. And so the phrase they came up with later was that the dimming prize for most companies was the death of quality, winning the prize and it was all over, whereas for them it was the cradle. And that was because they thought in a different way about management. And they ended up with uh, what they hope uh, is a sustainable management system. This took a long time, and there were a lot of experiments. I would say there were probably 20 years of experimentation and in very rapidly changing circumstances. But of course, uh, you're never through. Uh, it's always important to remember uh, on our journey that, uh, well, it is never actually over. And that's unclear to me, but perhaps they now need to evolve their management system further. I just don't know. It's interesting, there have been two great crises at Toyota prior to the current moment, uh, which was 1950 when they effectively went bankrupt and decided that they henceforth would forever not have to depend on anyone, particularly bankers, so they would always carry lots and lots of financial reserves. And then 1973-75 when they had the first oil crisis and the first uh, yen shock, uh, in which the yen went from 360 to the dollar to about 180 in the course of two years. And if you're primarily exporting in dollars, uh, that, uh, that is a problem. Now, of course, we get to the third crisis. This uh, right now is sort of the Job moment at Toyota, that first you have the big recall in America, the mysterious uh, kind of consumer panic, uh, followed by the earthquake and tsunami, followed by, quite amazingly, the yen just gets stronger and stronger to a historic record, uh, followed by the floods in Thailand, where the company had recently moved a lot of production to get away from the strong yen. So this is an endless sort of tale of woe. Uh, and what does that mean, though, about the management system? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I will say that in all times past, they have been able to do Hansei to reflect and say, are these just one-offs? You know, in a quality sense, is this a one-time thing? Is this being hit by an asteroid? Or is there a systemic problem here that's causing us to have catastrophe after catastrophe? So I'm sure they are deeply engaged in that Hansei process on how to think about that. So we will leave that to them. Uh, that's their problem. That's not our problem. I think no one here works for Toyota. Uh, I myself am reasonably confident that uh, they will come out of this having learned many things, done many more experiments, and will actually be better. But we have to wait and see. Now let me just uh, forget about them for the moment and talk about what happened to us, and when I say that, uh, in Europe, in America, in a lot of places all over the world when we tried to do lean. And the typical pattern was that some heroic leader, uh, when uh, the organization was lucky, even the CEO, was suddenly determined for whatever reason to march in a different path. And what that heroic CEO did was to launch a campaign uh, in which a large number of very useful tools were deployed. And lots and lots of Kaizen, uh, sort of a perpetual Kaizen. Uh, often organized by a vertical, a program office, the KPO office or whatever, uh, and often with major consultant presence. So that's the typical pattern. We're very used to that. Here is the CEO on the white horse uh, who comes on the field and says, let's charge that hill. And uh, here we have some tools, uh, some bright, shiny weapons. And here we have a uh, sort of um, uh, guard, uh, a, a, you know, a phalanx, an attack force of people who understand these tools and will show us how to use them. And that's OK. That's OK. That's something we're very familiar with. It feels comfortable. But it often leads uh, to some complications. And in particular, it rarely led to any actual thinking about the management system. 
that this was to be a war that was won by the frontline troops with the new tools, and there was actually almost no need for management once they were just pushed out of the way, sort of traditional management impediments. But then what do you do? And so it was discovered that you did have to think about organization. And one of the things that Dan and I saw a lot of was companies that thought they could turn the company sideways. They would create little mini companies, mini businesses by value stream, by product line. And uh, we even wrote uh, very approvingly of that in Lean Thinking and said, this is a wonderful thing. If you can do it, you should do it. Uh, others uh, said uh, it was time to rethink matrices. By the way, remember, a matrix, uh, you have var- vertical and horizontal. So you have the vertical boss, and you have the horizontal boss, and you're right here where they meet, and you have two bosses. And so then you figure out what to do. Uh, who's the really important boss? And uh, my experience with most matrices is that, uh, in fact, uh, you can't do that. And people do learn. And then all kinds of formal uh, policies is another path to go to avoid uh, conflicts. But note what's missing here is that most of the adopters spent very little time talking systematically about the actual work of management. I don't know of anyone I've ever seen who actually did an audit of their existing management system to determine the current state of management and then ask a very simple question, what management system do we need to make these new tools work? What management system do we need? Now, by the way, there is a lot of bad people analysis that is done. Uh, The natural uh, tendency of all humans, and I'm certainly just like everybody else, uh, when things aren't working is to figure out who's at fault. It's not the five whys, it's the one who, it's the bad boss, it's not me, it's you. And that's fine, except we all are saying the same thing, so therefore I'm pointing this way and everyone else is pointing this way. So what is lost here is an actual audit, an inventory of the current state of the management system, and then some systematic thinking about how to put in place a new management system that would be suited to this focus on how to get value to flow. And so what you get out of that uh, is typically dramatic improvements, rapidly, very satisfying in isolated pieces of the business. Uh, I had uh, someone I was talking to at the workshop yesterday who's on his 10th anniversary of having first encountered Lean and went through the whole story of how they had a brilliant consultant. They really did, I know who that consultant is. They had a brilliant consultant. And they achieved brilliant things very quickly, uh, which were not sustainable because there was no fit with the management system and this lean offensive. And so the consultant went away and the results disappeared in the review mirror. And I expect many of you have had that. So you get the dramatic results, and you really do. Uh, You've outsourced the management problem to some one group or some one individual. And there has been no actual change in the work of management. And by the way, the daily work of management at every level continues to be workarounds uh, for anomalous events. And anomalous in this case means bad. Uh, Managers do not work around good things, they work around bad things. So the management system doesn't change at all. Uh, And the results prove not to be sustainable. And so you get uh, regression to the mean. Uh, And by the way, all of those folks who tried to turn the company on the side uh, discovered uh, that actually verticals are there for a reason, that departments and functions are there because that's where we store knowledge. This is how we manage careers. This is where we put assets. Uh, They are there for an excellent reason. And just simply trying to get rid of them uh, turns out to be uh, an exercise in frustration. And then the matrix thing, uh, two bosses uh, means no boss, and then trying to just do formal policies to regulate behavior. Uh, Well, policies always lag reality, lag circumstance. So that is what has happened. Uh, With it all, we do continue to make some progress. This is not uh, some, uh, you know, autopsy here on a movement. It's just to say that we didn't and haven't made the progress we should have made. So what can we do about that? So that gets to now, uh, the challenge for us now. So let me suggest uh, some thoughts for you. Uh, When you go home, uh, while you're flying home, 
you might think a little bit about how could you do an audit of your management system. And by the way, you're not CEOs, most of you. Uh, I know that. Uh, you work at a place in the organization. That's okay. Start where you are. What is the management system right where I live? Do we really know? What is the work of management? Now, that's different from what managers do because most managers actually don't do much value-creating work, but they do the work that has to be done given the way the system works right now. Someone has to do workarounds if you have no method for solving problems, which means you'll just have more and more problems, so you need to do more and more workarounds, and if you're going to create any value for anybody, you need to do those workarounds. Please do not st stop doing workarounds in the absence of a management system that makes workarounds unnecessary. So just how does it actually work? And you can just do that on a piece of paper. Just write down the attributes, the features of your management system and what's wrong with it. And by the way, you're going to tell me, I know what you're going to tell me right now, that you've got the wrong metrics, you've got the wrong organization, and you're at the wrong level. And I say that's just fine. That's called adult life. Okay? You've got the wrong organization and the wrong metrics, and you're at the wrong place. So get to work. Uh, you know, this is very difficult, so you need to start immediately rather than wait for next week or next month. Again, second point there, what is it that you as a manager actually do? Not what are you supposed to do, uh, what you're told in business school to do, what do you actually do? And then how are horizontal and vertical in your organization reconciled? They must be reconciled in some way. How does that happen? And then... Ask about how your organization gains agreement on the important few things to improve. That's what policy deployment is supposed to be about. Do you have any mechanism at all? Uh, it is very different from the boss saying, I have a program and I have goals, to the people who are actually going to do the work saying, we're with you, we're engaged, as opposed to, mm, yeah, okay, this will go away soon, and so therefore we will nod but there's no actual engagement. So how do you actually engage people in gaining agreement? And if you have no method for doing that, if you have no functional equivalent of policy deployment, uh, what are you going to do about that? Uh, how do you actually deploy? Uh, OBEA is one of the tools of deployment of how to do projects. A3 is a tool for any kind of uh, initiative uh, to track it, and to figure out who's going to do what based on a definition of the problem and a careful evaluation of the alternatives, selecting one alternative and then doing an experiment in PDCA. How do you solve problems if you do solve problems? Perhaps you don't solve problems, but just say that, but take a look. How do you evaluate proposals that come up from the people below you? Uh, certainly as a manager, I've always found that one of the most difficult things to do, that uh, when I was running or pretending to run the Lean Enterprise Institute for 13 years, there were always people at my door with good ideas about how to improve what we were doing. And uh, for a long time, I really had no method for evaluating those other than say, sure, whatever, or please go away. Uh, and neither of those were a correct response. And then I myself tried to do A3. Kind of a great revelation to me one day that running our little business, I should actually be doing the things that I thought people should do in their business. Uh, it is interesting. <laughs> this uh, only dawned slowly on some of us. Uh, how do, as you look at your management system, how do you create stability? Many of you are going to say, what stability? <laughs> and that's true. There is no stability. But what management method do you have to actually root cause problems and make them go away? And then finally, as you look at your management system, how are you going to create the next generation of lean managers? Managers do not happen. They are created. Uh, what are you doing? What does your organization do? What is your plan for creating the managers that you need? And uh, the answer in a lot of organizations is, oh, we will send them to school, or they will just figure it out, or whatever. But none of those uh, actually is likely to work. So then you could do this very simply, an audit of your management system, and then say to yourself, well, what are the problems? Right where I'm managing, what are the problems? What is the disconnect between those good, lean things we're trying to do at the level of frontline work and the management system that's supposed to support those? What are the disconnects? And then what do we do? 
about that. And so, of course, you need to perform some experiments uh, to see what will work for you. As I say, why don't you lead from where you are? Uh, because you're at the wrong level, and you've got the wrong metrics, and you've got the wrong organization structure, and that just means you're living an adult life in the modern world. And so what do you propose to do about that? So, um, finally, uh, let me say that for any organization, uh, you will discover that you need a unique management system that in some ways is different from what anyone else has done that suits your reality. So that simple copying, that point number two there, is so attractive, but it is actually always a bad idea. You have to look at your actual reality. What system do you actually need? What experiments do you need to prove it? And that's going to take quite a lot of experiments. Uh, think about this of Kaizening or Kaikakuing. That's uh, Kaikaku is the revolutionary uh, thing. Uh, Kaizening management, as opposed to Kaizening specific steps in the process. We're so comfortable with that, but we don't really have a grip on how to Kaizen management. And then, of course, as you do that, and the reason that Dan created the Lean Enterprise Academy and I created the Lean Enterprise Institute, is to have a venue for sharing. Sharing your experiments. Bring your A3s so that other people can learn from your experience, you can learn from their experience. Uh, that's what we need to do now, I think, in this movement, on our watch, is to do a lot of experiments about management, to do those in a rigorous A3 format, and then to share. Uh, I think you can share what you learned about your management system because, in fact, it will not be exactly what anybody else needs to do. You are safe. Uh, it is precisely what you need to do, or at least the best that at this point in time you have been able to determine. So uh, that's where we are. Done a brilliant job of looking down at the level of the actual value-creating work, but have not done the job yet on stepping back, looking at the higher level, at the management system that makes the work possible. And so that is what we need to do when we go home. Thank you.